Hey everyone, this is Rohan Shah with BestEconTutor.com and in this video we'll be talking about labor demand, labor supply, and the market equilibrium. First, let's talk about the demand for labor. Now, it's weird because up until now in the course, demand has been the customers, the people, and supply has been the businesses. But here, it's actually reversed here, because here's the thing, the good being transacted now, the good, is hours of work. So basically, instead of pizzas being the good we're transacting, it's you know hours of work at Pizza Hut, for example. So. If you think about it, who's the customer, the demand in that case, who's purchasing, you know, paying for hours of work? Well, Pizza Hut is technically paying the employees, so the employees are actually the supply curve, but the business itself is the demand for labor, because they're the ones demanding the labor. Now, here, we're going to be more objective about how we find the demand curve. The demand curve for labor is always MVPL, aka marginal value product of labor. It's also sometimes called MRPL, marginal revenue product of labor. But all it is is, if you have perfect competition, it's just always equal to P times MPL. So let's think about why, what that even means. So let's say you have a pen factory, you make pens, and let's say you wanted to find your demand for pen workers, right? Workers who produce pens. Well, let's see, here's what it's going to be. All you're asking yourself is how much money, in terms of revenues, is the first worker bringing for me? That's technically the most I'm willing to pay them, right? I wouldn't pay them anymore, but I'd hopefully pay less, but that's the most. So here's how we can do that. All we need is the MPL. Now, just to refresh your memories, MPL, marginal product of labor, is basically, in this context, it's saying how many pens. Notice it's not measured in dollars, how many pens does the next worker make? Next, right? Just that one alone. So what this means is the first worker alone makes me 10 pens. Now if I'm selling pens for two bucks a piece, well then, how much money and revenues am I making from this worker? I hired them, they made 10 pens for me, I sold them for two bucks each, so that's $20 in revenues that I got from that first worker. Notice this is now the quantity of workers, which is really L, not quantity of pens. The second worker, again, so it's marginal, so the second alone, so we're ignoring the first, the second guy alone makes me seven pens, and I'm, again, selling them for two bucks each, so I'm making $14 off that worker. Third worker, he made me four pens, two each, so I made $8, and finally the fourth worker made me just one pen, so I made $2 off of them. So either way, these values are the marginal value product of labor or marginal revenue product of labor and usually it goes down because the more workers you hire they kind of get into each other's way and the MPL tends to decrease right so here we could make the MVPL thing you know is uh, 20 14 8 2 and that this is your demand curve the y values of your demand curve for labor now let's talk about the supply of labor so if you're an employee, how many hours would you want to work, depending on your wage? That's the supply of labor. Here's the thing. Now, we make a lot of assumptions here again, so it might not be true in the real world, but here's one big assumption we make. We assume that you are allowed to work as many hours as you want to. So if you want to work 13 hours a week, 48 hours a week, 62, 48, you know, like, you know, any number, it doesn't have to be exactly 40 hours a week like it normally is. So either way what we have here is um, this situation where if you're at home relaxing aka leisure every hour that you're relaxing on Facebook technically you could be working. So there's always that opportunity. Cause. So here's a weird sounding question. How much does it cost you to use Facebook? What is the price of leisure of relaxing? might seem like it's zero, you don't have to pay to be on Facebook, but as we just said, the opportunity cost is your wage. So really, every hour that you're relaxing on Facebook, you're technically, let's say you make $10 an hour. 
then every hour on Facebook, you're kind of thinking to yourself, I just lost $10 because I could have been working with these assumptions. So what do you think would happen if your wage were to go up to $20 an hour? Let's say you got to raise 20 an hour now instead of 10. Every hour on Facebook, you're feeling more and more guilty. You're like, oh man, now I just lost $20 that for that hour instead of just 10. So if we flash back to what the substitution effect is, the substitution effect is saying that when anything becomes expensive, you want less of it. That's like the law of demand, right? If the price goes up, you want less of that good. Here, that good is leisure, relaxing. So it's kind of like the thing you could be doing instead of work. So whenever your wage goes up, if wage goes up, that's kind of like saying the price of leisure, the price of you know using Facebook has gone up when your wage does, and so you want less of that, less Facebook time, meaning more work. So that's why it tends to go like this, because the higher your wage, the more you're sort of thinking, oh, I should work more because now Facebook costs me more and more to use because I'm giving up more, and so you want to do less of that uh, Facebook, which means more work. So you're going to work more and more hours when your wage goes up. That's when the substitution effect is strong. However, at some point, there comes a wage level, let's say at $300 an hour. And again, this isn't a guarantee. This is just for some people it might happen, where you're making so much money now that actually you're thinking, you're kind of satisfied with the amount of money you have. So if you were to get a raise now at the 310 an hour, you kind of aren't really feeling like, oh, you need to work even more. In fact, you're probably thinking, you know, hey, leisure, it's kind of like a normal good, right? If you have more income, not only do you want to buy more restaurant meals and diamonds, but you also want to buy more Facebook time, more time to just relax and hang out with your family. And so when your income goes up further, you kind of are now able to buy more of that and work less. So essentially it kind of starts going, so objectively, this is a downward sloping supply curve because from left to right, it's going down versus here from left to right, it's going up. So long story short, whenever the substitution effect is greater than the income effect, your labor supply is upward sloping. And whenever your labor, your substitution effect is less than your income effect. So here the income effect is dominating. Here the substitution effect is dominating. Then on this range, you're going to have a kind of downward sloping uh, labor supply curve. For most people, again, not guaranteed, but for most people, the labor supply is going to look like backward bending because at first for lower wage levels, substitution effect dominates, and for higher wage levels, the income effect tends to dominate. And finally, let's look at the equilibrium, where labor supply and labor demand meet. Now, again, the y-axis here, the price of labor, there's a specialized name for that, wage. So that's the equilibrium wage that everyone's going to get. And that's the quantity of hours worked. You can even call that employment level if you want. Now, here's a question. What would make either of these curves shift? Well, all you got to do is think about whether the event in the real world affects the businesses, which are actually the demand curve for labor, or the workers, which are supplying labor. So if there's like something related to the taxes that the workers have to pay, that's going to affect the supply curve. And you can imagine if taxes go up, you want to work less, so that shifts to the left. Or if taxes are lowered, supply would shift to the right. Now, on the other hand, what if the price at which you're selling your good increases? So you're sort of selling your good at a higher price. Well, keep in mind, the demand is P times MPL. Again, it's kind of like saying if the guy is making me four pens and I'm selling them for two bucks each, four times two, that's where that comes from. It's like, that's how much money you're making from them is the demand curve, price times the quantity of pens that they make, their MPL. So either way, if you're getting more money per pen, that's the price going up, so you're getting more money from each person, so that's the demand shifting to the right in that case. That would be the new demand if you're, the price went up, or, or if somehow the MPL went up, meaning if they became more productive. Now here's the thing. So, Another thing we could look at here is we, we, we kind of did in module five earlier, it's called the minimum wage. It's kind of like a price floor because it's saying you have to pay at least this much. So if your minimum wage is set somewhere above the equilibrium wage, let's say the equilibrium wage is 10, but the government sets a minimum wage of 15. Now what happens is people demand fewer workers, but a lot more people want to work, so they supply more workers. And so what you end up having is you're not in equilibrium, you have this gap, this excess amount of workers, right? More workers are supplying hours of work, 
and not that much are demanded. No, nobody wants to hire somebody at 15, but a lot of people want to work. So you have an ex a surplus of workers. Those extra workers who can't find jobs, that's called unemployment. So that's how you can actually see unemployment on your supply and demand for labor graph if there's a minimum wage. Now let's look at a couple student questions. What exactly does consumer and producer surplus mean in the labor market? Well, the consumer surplus is actually now kind of looking at the profit of the business because again, the demand is the business. Consumer surplus would normally be how happy the consumers are, but here the consumers are the businesses consuming labor. So really, it's how much profit they're making. It's kind of like this guy made me $20 in revenues, but I only paid him eight, so I got $12 in profit. So if you add up all that, that's the consumer surplus, that's the profit. And the producer surplus is really just how much happiness the workers have. And a final question. How do we know exactly where the labor supply curve starts bending backwards? Now, the basically the bend, where it happens, it's gonna vary from person to person. It depends on when, for them, their income effect starts overtaking their substitution effect, if at all. So it might not even bend for some people. It really depends on which effect's dominating and it's totally subjective varies from person to person. Well, I hope you now understand economics better, and if you really want to make sure you've mastered the concept, check out our active learning, customized platform at besteconTutor.com. It's like having a one-on-one -on -one tutor right in front of you 24-7. You can click here to try it out for free. And we'll be adding more topics and videos on YouTube, so make sure you subscribe below for the latest updates.